Oh, good evening. Whoa, 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 that one's whoa. on. That one's on. Hello. Wow. That one's on. Hey, good evening. I want to welcome you uh, to the Neuro Lectures Renewal Weekend. Uh, this is our Saturday evening presentation, and, and so we're glad that you're here and that you're able to be here, uh, considering all things that have happened over the last 24 hours or so with all the wind and storms and whatnot. So, uh, welcome. I want to point out a couple of things uh, by way of orientation this evening, and so invite folks to, to find their seats there, and you'll see right there on your chair, you're going to see a little card that looks like this. Uh, we're using this ca same card at all our presentations uh, through, the, through the weekend, at least here on Saturday. And what it is is an opportunity uh, for us to hear uh, back from folks that have participated, uh, what are some of the things that you have enjoyed, things that you've experienced, and things you'd like us to consider as we plan future educational opportunities. So there's a couple questions on there uh, for you to answer. And then if there's any things that you'd like us to know in addition to those questions, just simply write those on the back. Um, and so afterwards, I'll be collecting those uh, over in the hallway here. And so uh, please give those to me. We'll use those to go on to our adult spiritual formation team, which we'll be taking a look at that and using that for our future planning and whatnot. If you have your card, pick up your card for just a second on your seat. And on the back, you'll see a number there. It should say the number three. Does own number three? Is there a number three? And does anybody have a three with an asterisk? Who has the three with the asterisk? You have the three. Who has the three with the asterisk? Does someone's card has that? Does anyone have a three with an asterisk next to our star? Is there a three with a star? Draw on a star? You can, because it's no. one of the seats that's not. Who has the one with the three with a star? You can pretend like that's yours. Pretend like that's yours. Karen, that can be yours. So what we have for you is we have a copy of Mark's commentary on Ephesians. <laughs> There's so little trust in this crowd here, they think something's going to happen to you. If you have a star next to yours, you're next to your speaker. Oh, no. <laughs> so another, another thing to point out by way of orientation, um, lots, of, lots of you here, you've been, you've been here before. I uh, just want to note that uh, there are uh, several different restroom options. Uh, the best ones are probably to go down the hallway and use those. If you want to use these ones up here, this is for the more brave and courageous be filming your bathroom stop <laughs> on YouTube tonight so because this presentation is actually going to be broadcast uh, live it's going to be streamed it's actually streaming right now on YouTube uh, and then immediately following uh, this presentation will be available at the church's YouTube channel so if it's if you miss anything or you want to see see something or if you know someone that would benefit from hearing some of the things that are uh, being shared here tonight please direct them to that um, it's a great chance to see that or your small group to be able to check, check that out uh, so without any further ado, I want to invite our speaker, uh, uh, Mark Roberts, is coming up. And Mark is the executive director of the Max Dupree Center at Fuller Theological Seminary, uh, a center that is actually uh, focused on issues related to leadership. And Mark has uh, also authored, or at least co-authored or authored? Do I have that right? Authored? Yeah. Authored what? Your Ephesians, co your Ephesians oh, commentary. Oh, yes. I did write the Ephesians commentary. So that was a test. We almost found out if you wrote it or not. No, I did. I you did. I, I, I've written some other stuff and co and co-authored some. That's why I was wondering what yeah, the yeah. question was. Okay. So the Ephesians commentary. No, that was just me. That was just you. Yeah. So he is he has authored a, a commentary on Ephesians. But uh, w let's welcome Mark. He's already here. So let's welcome him. Yeah. That's actually a good word about the restrooms. Are, is the sound piped in there? In the bathroom. Yeah. Hold on. <laughs> All right. Hey Jimmy, are you in there? No. So in my church in Irvine, the, the sound was actually piped into the restrooms for the sanctuary, and, which is kind of a funny thing. So anyway, but one, one day before the service, I thought, well, I better use the restroom. So I, in using the restroom, and the worship leader starts up and says, you know, where's Pastor Mark? Where's Pastor Mark? And then literally she said, oh, he's probably in the restroom. We're like, good, great. <laughs> That's really weird. <laughs> so anyway, you know, yes, you're welcome to use that. You just have to like be courageous, I guess. So anyway, so good to be with you. I, I've enjoyed being with several of you today during uh, different ways in which we have gathered. Uh, this morning, many of us were together. Some of you streamed it. I know at least one. How many streamed the thing on this morning? All right. Well, the, you, you win the, you know, I, like we ought to have like the, the Kindle version of, of the book gets sent to the people who streamed it, right? That should be, 
<laughs> That's a good idea. There is a Kindle version of it, by the way, if you're so inclined. Uh, so it's been good to be with you. I, I, I enjoy the, this church. I was with you last April. I was able to preach and get to know some of you, and great to get to know a few more of you and hang out and be together. And I sure appreciate your church and who you folks are. And it's really good to be back with you. Uh, how many were not here this morning or, or didn't stream it? So this is new to you. All right, let me give a, uh, good, let me give a little uh, word of introduction. So, and for others, it will be a bit of a reminder of where we have come. So we are looking at Ephesians and we're really focusing in on vocation or calling. I explained this morning that those, biblically speaking, are really the same con, con uh, same basic idea, same content in vocation and calling. A vocation coming from the Latin, calling in English coming from Old Norse, but the idea, the literal thing is if somebody calls out to you, that's a calling. Uh, from that comes through the biblical story, the picture of God calling people into his service. So we think of what happens to Moses at the burning bush. God calls him into service. We think of Samuel gets called into service. Isaiah gets called into service. And so the language of calling then begins to be used. There it's still a literal calling from God to people. But as we move into the New Testament, it takes on a little different sense, not of a, a literal voice being heard, but is a way of talking about the kind of people we're to be, the kind of life we're to live, uh, coming from the Lord, emerging from what God has done in Christ. And this morning we looked at uh, Ephesians 4.1 especially, that it says that we're to live a life or to walk worthy of the calling with which we've been called. And what we looked at this morning is that calling really emerges from the first three chapters of Ephesians, from the story of what God has done and is doing and will do in Christ. And as that story gets laid out for us of God's intentions, especially God's intention for the fullness of time, God has a plan, and the plan is to gather together or to unify all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. We saw that that really is God's ultimate response to what happened in sin. And when sin entered in God's perfect creation and broke it all apart, Eventually, through Christ, God's going to put it all back together. So God's plan for the fullness of time is to unite or to gather up all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. And then as we continue on in the story of Ephesians, we discover that we're caught up into that story. That God is uh, doing in our lives what God is doing in the whole cosmos. That God is bringing... Uh, the, the broken pieces of our lives and putting us back together. And in fact, in chapter 2, it talks to the fact that, that once we were really dead in our trespasses and sins, and so not just broken, but dead, but God has made us alive in Christ. God has given us new life in Christ. We are saved by grace through faith, received in faith. It's nothing we do. But, Ephesians 2.10, we are God's handiwork or God's workmanship. We are our what God has made anew in Christ so that we might walk in the good works that God has for us. We're not saved by good works, but when we're saved by grace, received in faith, we're remade in Christ, and God has good things for us to do, and those good things are a part of God's plan, a part of God's work to put all things back together in Christ. And so we see that our life as Christians is not simply one of receiving God's goodness and being um, um, and delighting in it and enjoying it, though we get to do that. It isn't just a matter of being with God forever after we die, though we get to do that. It's a matter of living into the, the new life that God has for us as his people. When we get into the second half of Ephesians 2, there we discover that what Christ did on the cross actually accomplishes more than personal salvation. It also accomplishes the bringing together of divided peoples. And Paul talks in that second chapter in the second half about Jews and Gentiles being separate 
being divided, being hostile. And yet, through Christ in his death, uh, God breaks apart the wall of hostility that divides Jews from Greek, and they become one through Christ's work on the cross. And again, what we come to understand is that God's plan of pulling all things together and putting it all back together in Christ is now beginning to happen, not only through our individual salvation, but as divided people, hostile peoples, are brought together and unified, made one in Christ for the cross. So that as we get into the third chapter of Ephesians, we, we start to hear about the church. And the church is God's witness, God's sign to the whole cosmos that his plan is working. So if God is going to bring all things together in Christ, and the center of Christ's work is the cross, the proof that this is working, that this plan works, is the church as a united group of people, people united in Christ, people who are once separate, once it, it, hostile and enemies to each other are now brought together in Christ, are united, and that bears witness to the fact that God's plan is working. In the last part of the third chapter uh, is a prayer of Paul for the church that basically uh, uh, prays that, that God would fill the church with his love and with the fullness of himself. And then it ends with this wonderful doxology, a praise to God who is able to do, through his power present in us, is able to do far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in, Christ, in the church and in Christ Jesus. And so what we get in the first three chapters is this sort of um, wide panoramic picture of God's work that actually begins in the first chapter before creation itself, as God it sets us apart to be his people, God's plan for the fullness of time to bring all things together in Christ, God's work in our lives, raising us from death to life, making us anew, giving us good works to walk in, God's taking uh, peoples who are divided and bringing them together in Christ, and then, then forming the church as the example, the sign to the whole creation that God's plan is working and that God is then at work in us, filling us with his love, uh, filling us with his power through his spirit and is, is doing through us more than all we can ask or imagine. And on that basis, then we get to Ephesians 4, 1, that says, say, where Paul says, well, I therefore as a prisoner of the Lord um, urge you to, to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. It's the calling of the first three chapters. It's that whole picture of who you are now in Christ. Now, live it out, and chapters 4, 5, and 6 actually talk about how we live that out. Tonight, I want to focus on three particular topics. These were ones that I was asked to give some attention to and talk about what it means to live as... Um, called people in the context of our homes and our community and our workplace. And so that's what we're going to do for the rest of our time. And then after I go for about another 40-ish minutes, and then we'll have some uh, Q&R, some questions and responses. And, uh, and then it'll be late and I'll go home, go to bed. So that's kind of the game plan if you want to know wh where we are. So. Uh, let me, uh, if I may, let me offer a word of prayer, and then we'll jump right in. Gracious God, it's good to be here. I thank you so much for this church. I thank you for their hospitality and welcome. I thank you for their faithfulness. I thank you for their eagerness to grow in their knowledge of you and what it means to live as your people. Thank you, Lord, for the leaders that you've raised up here, for the fruit that has been uh, richly provided through the ministry of this church. Thank you for the chance we have tonight. And we pray that you will speak to us through your word tonight as we look at different passages that will understand more clearly what it is to live as the people whom you have called. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. 
Once again, I want to reiterate something I've said this morning that this passage that says to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received, this is given to all Christians. This is given to you. This is given to every person who belongs to Jesus Christ. So it, this calling is not just for pastors or missionaries or church workers or special people. It's given to all of God's people. All of us are called by God. All of us have the vocation to live out who we are in Christ. Now, that's going to take specific forms. That's going to be lived out in particular relationships and contexts. And we'll get to the workplace in a piece because usually we use, the, if we use the language of vocation and calling, it often refers to, um, to our professional lives, to our careers. And if you feel particularly drawn to something or it feels particularly important, you might refer to it as your vocation, your calling. There's a sense in which that's fine, but what we need to understand is that is actually an expression of uh, that's a, an instantiation of your big calling, which is to live out who you are in Christ in light of what God has done in Christ and is doing in Christ and wants to do in you in every part of your life. So, one part of your life in which you can live out your calling is in the context of family. Uh, now, I recognize that, that, I, I, that there are probably different configurations of family in this room. And I'm sure some of you fit a more traditional model and some less. Some of you may be single. Some of you may, you know, live at home with your parents. Some of you may not have parents anymore, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, we're going to talk in some, some generalities. This won't specifically address every one of us. But I, I hope that the underlying truth that we're going to talk about here tonight will be uh, encouragement to you because one of the things we need to notice about family life is that it is discussed in the context of what it is to live out your calling in the church. And, and what that means, what is simply assumed here, in a way, you could put it this way, your family is not just your private domain. Your family is actually a part of the life of the larger church. We tend in our culture often to sort of think of family as this separate thing. So our, our family can go to church, be involved in the church, but our family life is our, our private little sphere. And the Bible does not think of family that way. It thinks of the individual family as embedded in the life of the larger community. And so Paul assumes that as a leader of this Christian community, he has the right to speak into people's family life. Now that may seem real obvious and not need to be said, but I think it does need to be said. Because sometimes if, you know, if you hear things at church that sort of rub you the wrong way in terms of your own particular family life, you might want to say, well, they just better keep their nose out of my business. Truth is, it is our business to care about your family, to want your family to thrive and flourish. Uh, I would expect that if we had time, some of you here tonight could talk about how the church has been absolutely essential to the health and thriving of your family. You could give stories that way. I, 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 there may be some who could say, and sometimes the church you know, wasn't so helpful. But, that, that in many ways, I, I know so many people in my own context and from my pastoral life and my personal life where the, the, the church has, has helped marriages last that wouldn't have lasted. The church has helped parents be better at parenting. The church has helped children be better at children-ring. And, and uh, uh, I, I just think of a time in my own life. Or Linda and I have been married, oh, three years or so, and we were really going through a pretty hard stretch. We were just not getting along in certain ways, and we weren't quite sure what to do. Uh, and, and finally, we thought we'd invite a couple of our dear Christian friends to come and kind of sit with us and listen 
and maybe we could get some help there. And so we did. Uh, they weren't actually a married couple, but uh, one of my best friends, when Linda's, we got together and we, we were very honest. We shared things that, you know, we didn't look very good, but we told the truth about where we were and where we were struggling. And they had some observations and, and some reflections. They asked some questions. And, and as they got us to talk, I mean, we could all sense that God was doing something in the room. Uh, it, it, it wasn't it was even hard to explain because we could we knew that that God was working in my heart and in Linda's heart and actually at one point in the conversation one of our friends said you know I, I think what we ought to do is actually we're going to go in the next room and just pray for you guys and you just talk and it, it opened up to this place of great healing and it was it was an amazing moment and it only worked because partly we recognized that our marriage wasn't just ours. And we had a body of Christ that could love us and care for us. And that actually was, is a great illustration of where this passage on family life begins, which is a, a very shocking place even for us today. It was even more shocking in its day. So in the Greco-Roman world, there were a number of philosophers. It began with Aristotle, who created what they called household codes or tables. And basically, it was a list of instructions for the household. And, and the household was considered more broadly. So you'd start with instructions for husbands and fathers. It was always for the, by the way, only for the men. There was not any instruction for the children or the wives. The, the, sort of the instructions for husbands and fathers to keep their house in order, and then it would often go to instructions for, the, uh, for civic officials as kind of the next level of the household, if you will. Very common. Instructions for masters on how to treat slaves. Never anything for slaves. And what was the centerpiece of family life, and for that matter, wider civic life in the Greco-Roman world was the principle that there is a hierarchy that is to be honored that the people in charge are in charge, and that those who are under them need to be under their authority. That was just absolutely basic how it works in family and how it works in government, how it works in the wider household in terms of the slaves of the household and in business. It was this very hierarchical thing. And that was true of all the household discussions until you get to Ephesians 5 that begins Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, that might seem a little unsettling to even some of us. For us, it's more the whole idea of submission. You know, we don't, we don't talk about that very much. Right? We don't you tend to use that language much. Uh, you're not called to submit to things, and your job application, there isn't the question, will you submit to the leadership of this organization? We just don't like that language. Uh, but in this day, submit to one another. It just would have blown the minds of the people who received this. This is absolutely disruptive to their whole notion of how family and organizational life is supposed to work. You don't submit to each other you who are under submit to those above. That's the way it goes. Submit to one another would just have seen, it would have blown the minds of the people who first had this letter read to them. But that's where it begins. Now, what about this language of submission? What does it mean to submit? And again, there is a sense in which it means something akin to obey, uh, you submit by doing what somebody says. We would use the language today of following leadership, and that feels a lot less offensive. If it said follow the leadership of one another, we just wouldn't be um, scandalized by it. We might still say, how's that going to work? You know, if we all follow each other's leadership, that feels kind of chaotic, uh, but it doesn't have the the tone or, or, or the uncomfortableness of submission. Uh, 
In many ways, I think this verse could be paraphrased as follow the leadership of one another out of reverence for Christ. But if you really dig into the understanding of submission and how it functions, and you think, for example, of who in the Roman world, who were the people that submitted most of all? And the answer would be slaves. And then you start looking in the New Testament for how how the language of slavery is applied to our lives in Christ and that we are to be slaves of Christ and of one another in Christ. And what you realize is submitting isn't only about um, doing what somebody else wants you to do. Submitting is really a, a matter of offering your life in service to somebody else. So this, this verse doesn't mean only, you know, everybody follow what everybody else wants you to do. It, it, it's really about a more active kind of offering yourself in service to others. Uh, Galatians 5.13 says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Serve one another humbly in love. Very similar to submit to one another. And that's the framing of this whole text on family. And if that's all that was said, that would have been very unsettling in, in Paul's own day, but it otherwise would probably not get a lot of press today. It's just the next line is the one that gets people a little fired up. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. Now I expect all of us in here know there's some history behind the interpretation of that particular uh, verse and what it means. And there's a lot of dispute about what it means. And, and, and there are whole theologies of marriage and life and family life and church that are kind of built around this um, apparently unique responsibility that wives have to submit to their husbands. Uh, and there are some families that have managed to thrive and be healthy that way, and there are some that have been very abusive and horrible that way. But, but this is a whole way of being. Uh, I sort of grew up on the edge of that tradition. And, you know, I, when I was younger, I'd go to a lot of weddings, and the wedding sermon would, al would always end up talking about how the wife is supposed to submit to her husband. The wedding sermons were always given by men, I might add, at, at back then. Uh, it's in the text, it says that. Ironically, if you're to look at the original language, there's not even a verb in this text. It's a verb picked up from the verse that I just read. So it's submit yourself, it's actually a participle there, submitting yourselves to one another, wives to your own husband as to the Lord. Now why is that important? Because for some reason, an awful lot of the teaching on the submission of wives rather ignores the, the, the framing of that submission that says is submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, admittedly, this is a little tricky. You say, well, how does this work? In fact, some, actually some people I, I greatly respect, Christian teachers say, look, really mutual submission doesn't work in marriage. Because it doesn't work. You can't have two people in charge. You know, in the end, you gotta have somebody in charge. And the person in charge, according to scripture, it's taught is the husband. Because the mutual submission thing really doesn't work. I don't know if you've ever heard that teaching. I've heard it, I've read it. By people I respect. You know, unfortunately, when Paul writes, submit to one another, there isn't the little footnote that says, you know, not really, because it doesn't work. It's just sort of left there as something troubling. But the text goes on, and this is where the, the, the traditional view would get some, it seems to get some encouragement. For it says, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he's the Savior. And now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself 
as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And this is a profound mystery. I'm talking about Christ and the church. Now, I don't have time to teach everything in this text, and the good thing is I've actually written something about it, so if you're interested, you can go find it. But a couple things to note. The text says that Christ is the head of the church. Usually when we read that, we say, well, Christ is the authority of the church. The beginning of the Presbyterian Book of Order, Christ is the Lord of the church. Christ is the head of the church. Uh, head is authority, and that's why the wives submit. And so the argument goes, if a husband is going to be the head, then that's about the exercise of authority. Now, that all sounds reasonable, but there are problems with that. The first problem is that it doesn't pay close attention to the use of the meaning of the word head in Paul's letters and especially in Ephesians. In Greek, you could use the language of head for authority and you could use the language of head as like the head of the river, the, 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 the head waters, we would say, the source of something. And both, were, both meanings can be used. And so the way you tell which one you have is from the context. If you were to go back to Ephesians 4, 15 and 16, it talks there about speaking the truth in love so that we may grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ from whom the body makes growth as each member does its part. Now you watch the language here. We're to grow up into Christ who is the head from whom the body makes growth. What is not said there, though it is true, is that Christ is the authority over the church. The headship of Christ in relationship to the church in Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 is Christ being the source of the church's life and growth. Now you go to this text. You say, what does it mean for the husband to be the head? In this text, what is it that Christ as the head of the church does? And you'd say, well, doesn't he exercise authority? That's not what is mentioned here. What does Christ do here as the head of the church? It says, for as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior, so first of all, the headship of Christ is related to his saving of the church. It's number one. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives. So you know, as head, there's saving. Christ does that. There's loving. Love your wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. There's giving himself up for her. And then if you go on in the text, it also talks about how husbands should love their wives as they love their own bodies. It talks about how Christ feeds and cares for the church. You say, what does, in this text, what does Christ as head do? He saves, he loves, he cares, he gives up to himself, he feeds, he nourishes. That's what he does as head. Which incidentally is the same thing that Christ was doing for the church as head in chapter four. Now. Does that mean that there is no role of, of authority in the notion of headship? No. But what it means is if we let this text us its meaning without projecting into it, what we get is that the wife, that everybody's to submit to each other, and that would be mutual submission even within marriage. So, well, that's complicated. God was never afraid of complicated. Wives are to submit to their husbands, so that's an instance of that thing. Husbands are the head. What are they to do? They're to love their wives. They're to give up themselves for their wives. They're to be uh, nurturing and feeding and caring for their wives, as Christ has done for the church. That's what his headship means in this text. That's what we're told it is for Christ to be head of the church. But even more so, and this is where this is 
so important. Again and again as we read this, it talks about how there's this mystery and husband and wife become one flesh. And you're, you're, the, the, the husband loves his wife as his own body. The head and the body are, are connected. And what we see is that the, the main point of the head and body imagery here in talking about Christ and the church and therefore about husband and wife in marriage goes again back to the main thesis of Ephesians. What is God doing? God is uniting things in Christ. The main point of the headship imagery in this text is first and most importantly, it's a statement about the unity of Christ in the church. And out of that unity, there's an analogy to human marriage that husband and wife are to be deeply and profoundly united as Christ is to the church. And in that deep unity, there is submission to one another. And in that deep unity, there's a particular call to the husband who was living in an extraordinarily patriarchal culture to be a person who loves and gives up himself and sacrifices himself. Now, I realize that that can sound confusing, new, like, ah, I didn't ever think that's what this text said. So, you can take a lot of time and read and study it. There is only one passage in the whole New Testament in which the language of authority, exercising authority, is used in marriage. There's only one verse, and it's 1 Corinthians 7, 4. You can look it up later. And what that verse says is in the context of sexuality in marriage. But what that verse says, 1 Corinthians 7, 4, is it says the wife does not have authority or exercise authority. That's your verb, exercise authority. The wife does not exercise authority over her own body, but the husband does. You say, aha, I knew it. It's there. There it is. Headship, authority. Unfortunately, that's not the end of the verse. The verse then says, and the husband does not have authority over his own body, but his wife does. And again, I, I have brothers and sisters who would teach that kind of relationship doesn't work. You can't have equal authority or, I mean, how's it ever going to work itself out? And my answer is, well, I don't know, but I did not write the Bible, so you take it up with the author. <laughs> no, I do have some ideas. Uh, but the point then is, and this needs more work, and I, we can, we can, you can ask questions about it, because I realize the way I talk about this is rather different from how it is often talked about. But partly that reflects the, the effort that I have made to try and let the text talk for itself and not make it say things it doesn't say, whether I want them to be said or not. Uh, but it also reflects just my own personal experience of trying to work out a marriage in today's world. When my wife and I, we've been married almost 34 years. When my wife and I were first married, we, we, we were both very strong-willed people. We still are, but we were new at trying to work out a relationship with two strong-willed people. And it was pretty tricky. And one of the things that was early on very tricky for us was what to do with the money we'd been given for our wedding, primary, you know, wedding gifts. It was $3,000, which in 1984 was a big amount of money, like $10,000 or twelve today or something. So it was a lot of money. And I knew absolutely what we should do with that $3,000. That's how much a computer cost back then. And we should buy a computer. I mean, absolutely, I had the exact one. It was that compact portable that was the size of a sewing machine. And it was almost exactly $3,000. And it would be perfect for our life and our work. And it was absolutely what we should do with the money. And Linda was absolutely sure she knew what we should do with the money. We should take a trip to Europe. <laughs> and I'm like, but then the money will be gone. And she's like, yeah, but we will have had a great experience together. And like, so we were absolutely stuck. And it was awful. And we fought, and we were, oh, man. So finally, I, I, I thought, I need to take some time and go away and pray. I need to pray. So 
I went up the mountains and I was going to pray about that. And I was thinking a lot about Ephesians and being the head. And, and at that point, I thought, you know, I need to be the spiritual leader, the family head. I got to be the authority. How am I going to exercise my authority to get her to do the right thing, which, of course, was to buy the computer. And uh, so literally, I get out there and I'm like, Lord, what should I do with this? You know, and, and literally what came to mind, you got to love Linda the way I love the church and gave up myself for her. I'm like, oh, Lord, I don't want to do that. Now let's do it. And seriously, we, we argued, Lord and I, a lot about that. But I realized even then in my understanding of headship, which isn't like what I understand now, I was simply being asked to do what the head is supposed to do and gave up himself for her, which in that case was like, oh, man, you know, go to Europe. So we did. So I came home. I told Linda. I prayed about this. And uh, I really believe God wants us to go to Europe. So that's what we're going to do. And, and she was, you know, of course, it meant a ton to her. And of course, what she said to me is, well, then, I mean, we will work really hard to, to save that money to buy a computer for you because I know you really want that. And it, like, it so changed our relationship. But for me... It was the first personal experience of a reset and what headship is all about. It's being like Christ with the church. It, it, you can talk there about mutual submission or you can talk about, no, I was exercising my headship by giving up what I wanted for my wife, which ends up feeling a lot like submission. So that's part of the family piece. We can talk more about that. The next one is community. And then I'll say a little bit about work. For the community piece, uh, just we could read more, but especially Ephesians 5, 8 through 14. It says, for once you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That's why it is said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So a couple points I want to make out of this text that talks how we live you know, out in the community, understanding that it is a place of darkness, which is not to say the light of Christ is completely absent from it, but it's, it's, it's a place of darkness. And once we were darkness, but now we're light in the Lord. So what do we do? It is, it is common in many Christian communities of varying theological stances to say the primary thing we do as Christians when faced with darkness, when faced with evil, is we denounce it. So if you're more conservative in your theology, in your practice, you denounce um, things like abortion and, and, and you know, pornography, and, and more the, you, you denounce things that are more on the, that conservative people denounce. The lack of prayer in school, uh, uh, godlessness in our society and all that. If you're, if you're on the liberal end, you denounce things like you know, guns and um, various kinds of social injustices. The point is that mostly what we are supposed to do then as Christians when it comes to the darkness is we speak against it. You'll hear people talk about speaking truth to power. So we got to go speak the truth to all the darkness around us. There's not, there, there are places in scripture that might teach us about that. But it's interesting that this one says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. You say, aha, we should talk about them. Well, it's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. So well, how are we going to expose stuff if we don't mention it? Well, it's something about things being exposed by the light. Well, and how is the light, how is the light going to expose stuff if we don't stand up and denounce our neighbors for whatever their 
issues are. We don't denounce the things in our society. What, how does the light get out there? So we go up a couple verses. Once you were darkness, now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And then further down it says, everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. Now what is this, how does this answer the question? How do we expose the darkness? In this text, we do by living as children of the light. Because the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. So what this text is calling us to is to living in the world where there is darkness in such a way that the light of Christ is seen in us, is shining through us, and that has primarily to living in such a way that we are contributing all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And the word righteousness in scripture it can also often be translated as justice. So what primarily are we to do here with the, the evil around us in this text? We are to live out our lives in such a way that it is productive of the fruit of goodness and righteousness, justice, and truth. And as we live that way in the darkness, the light of Christ shines through who we are such that the darkness is exposed and everything that is illuminated becomes a light and there's a redemptive character. So it's not, it's not just a denouncing of the evil, it is the transforming of the evil, it's the transforming of the darkness into light as we allow the light of Christ to shine through us into the world. Now, that may or may not be uh, uh, a different way of thinking, but um, it's rather similar to what Jesus said, isn't it? Let your light shine before others in such a way that they'll see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So our role, if we're going to live out our calling, is to live in such a way that the light of Christ is reflected out of our individual lives, but especially our light together in such a way that there is goodness and righteousness and justice and truth. Now, does that mean we should never speak out against evil? No, I don't think it means that. I'm just saying that's not what is being spoken of here. But my concern for the Christian community, and again, I'm talking about conservative to liberal and everywhere in between, is how easy it is for us to denounce evil out there without offering any kind of compelling other way of living. You know, if we get up and speak against racism, racism is, is evil. But we ourselves are, are, are not people who are welcoming of those who are other. What do we have to offer? It's empty. It's hypocritical. And, and I think far too often, we who are the church have allowed ourselves to think that by denouncing things out there, we're somehow doing the business of bringing some kind of cultural and world reform, when in fact, we're not doing the thing we're to do, which here is living as children of light, which Jesus talks about as being a light, our being the light in the world so that people see our good works and give glory to the Father who is in heaven. So living in the community, living out your calling by being who you are in Christ, living who you are in Christ in every context in which you live, work, neighborhood, community association, wider kinds of friendships, when you're out with the guys or out with the women or whatever it is, wherever you are, be who you are in Christ in such a way that people perceive the light that's in you through the way that you are. And that exposes 
the darkness. And it has the potential for transforming the darkness into light. Five minutes left. I want to talk about the workplace. There's one passage in Ephesians that specifically mentions work. It's a passage that is sadly sometimes greatly misunderstood. It's Ephesians 4.28. It says, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Now, this verse appears to give a traditional answer to the question, why does our work have value? Well, our work has value because through our work, we can make money, and with the money, we can do good things. We can give to those who are in need. Those of you who have well-paying jobs, you make money, you can take the money, you can give it to the, to the church, you can give it to mission organizations, therefore your work has value. Uh, the real work that has value in the traditional view is what the pastors do, what the missionaries do. You're not a pastor or a missionary, that's really too bad, but in your second class status, you can earn money to pay those who are really doing the work that matters. Now you laugh, but that may ne I, I doubt that's ever been taught from the pulpit here, but you sometimes wonder in terms of the values of our churches, isn't that kind of what we've been saying to people? Well, then you look here and you say, yeah, it says you shouldn't steal. Well, that's, you know, Ten Commandment kind of stuff. You should work doing something useful with your own hands so you may have something to share with those in need. That's what it teaches here. Yes, in translation, no, that's not what it teaches here. If, if you were to go to the original language, uh, this is what it says. It says, anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work... Uh, working energetically that which is good that they may have something to share with those in need. Now, if any of you took Greek in college or, you know, I know a couple of you went to seminary, you can go check me out here. You go say, well, you know, wait, this says useful. Um, other translations have other words. What do you mean good? You go and it's, in Greek, it's the word agathos. It's the basic Greek word for good. When Plato talked about the good, he talked about the agathos. This is basic Greek word for good. It has a derivative meaning of useful down there. But the main point here about work is that you shouldn't steal, but you should do work working energetically that which is good so that you'll have something to share with those in need. So now all of a sudden we have two reasons, if you will, for why work matters, why work has value. It has value, number one, because we can do what is good through our work. And number two, because our work creates income that can be given away. Now, once again, if we go back to Genesis and what we're created for, and God who is the worker, God who is the creator, creates human beings in God's own image to be fruitful and multiply and basically to be workers. We're, we are to work. God creates us for that purpose, to do good work. It gets all messed up because of sin. But God who is in the process of putting all things back together through Christ, gathering up things in Christ, mending the brokenness of creation through Christ, is also about the business of mending and putting back together our work and the purpose of our work, our daily work. The work of doing the dishes and Jimmy changing diapers and, you know, educating kids and um, adjudicating lawsuits and selling products and all that kind of stuff is meant to be a part of the good work that God has given us to do. Now, we recognize that we live in a fallen world, and that workplaces aren't what they ought to be, and sometimes work does evil, and sometimes work is flat out bad, like stealing. You're not to do that. Sometimes our work is kind of mixed up. You're not sure, man, how does, 
you know, selling this widget to all these people actually contribute to God's good in the world. It's worth thinking about. I have a friend who was an executive vice president at Coca-Cola and a deep Christian, and she had to think a lot about how is this uh, uh, an expression of, you know, goodness? Say, Bonnie, you're just like selling sugar water to the world. Well, she had a different way of thinking about that in terms of providing jobs and et cetera, et cetera. Point is this. If we are going to walk worthy of our calling, our vocation to be God's people in the world, that is going to influence how we understand and practice our work, whether it's the work at home, in the community, in our offices, in our stores, in our workshops, where in our classrooms, in our studios, all the places that we work, because we're going to begin to realize that what I'm doing all week is meant to be a part of the good work that God has called me to. So how does that affect the way I do my work, the way I think about my work, my values at work, my relationships at work, my goals at work, my use of time at work, the way I treat people at work, et cetera, et cetera. It's transforming. It's yet another one of the ways we live out the calling we have to walk worthy of our calling that we have in Christ going to affect everything. So it's family, it's community, it's workplace, it's church, it's everything else. All right, time for Q&R. All, All right. right, so for you guys' questions, we're going to go around with a microphone just so we can capture it on the video. And so we said this to the earlier group uh, today that if you don't use the microphone, it's not really a question. So you got to use the microphone. And funny, someone didn't use the microphone, but they actually just made a statement. So they kind of fulfilled that. Uh, so if you have. And then you get edited out. And it's yes. just, yeah. yeah. So, if you, so if you have a question, just shoot your pop real quick, and we'll, we'll bring the mic around to you. Guinea pig that I am. Um, the one thing that came to my mind, and maybe it's because of the last 24 hours of dodging tree limbs and so forth, when you were talking about what it means to be in community and, and what we serve, what came to my mind was that gives real meaning to the drag that log out of your eye because that's I'm blocking my light from shining yeah. into that darkness yeah. before I go around announcing everybody yeah. else. Yeah, man. Not a question. No, but it's it's. But I'll I'll treat it as a as a kind of a question. Um, one of the things I do a lot in in my work at the Dupree Center is work with Christians in the workplace and to help them live out their faith in the workplace. And it is distressing to me how often I will hear something like, "Oh, I've worked with Christians. You know, I, I you can't trust them as far as you throw them." I mean, you know, there are people who, I mean, maybe in, in their family life and, you know, in church, they're like model citizens. I actually know somebody who fits this. And the workplace, you know, just awful. So the log there, so now if this guy starts talking to people about the gospel at work, it's going to set us back. You actually want him to be quiet. <laughs> So, yeah, so the taking out of the logs from our own eye, being inspired by the actual logs being taken out, yeah, around the community, yeah. Other questions that you might have? Because everything I said is so obvious and familiar. There are none. Well, I'm going to come up and I'm going to put uh, Mark on the spot here just for, uh, he doesn't know this is coming. Okay. So hence the on the spot. So, Sorry. So um, one of the things that and they're going to find out here when they check their inboxes sometime this evening, the next morning, there's a couple of resources that you've made available um, for folks uh, that you're going to guys have access. Can you talk a little about those yeah. resources yeah. Uh, with us just so they know what, what's coming? Right. So. One of the things I get to do at the Dupree Center is work with some great folks on uh, 
resources for spiritual growth in general, but especially related to the workplace thing. This last piece is really the larger piece of what I do uh, most of the time and, and what my team does. And we've, we've uh, developed some resources that I, I'd love to make available to you. Now, one is a collection of studies and guides and different things that we have put together that you can find all at our website. Our website, uh, the, the URL is Dupree, D-E-P-R-E-E, -E, Dupree.org. If you Google on Mark Wa Roberts Fuller Seminary, you'll get there too, but Dupree.org. So you can find um, different things that we have created. One of the things we did this last year is called a seat at the table. It's a study guide on women in scripture related to the workplace. That's really meant to encourage and empower women in the workplace. And we started doing this thing before the Me Too stuff came out. And then all of a sudden, it became really hot. And, and it, because it's really trying to build, it's not just addressing a problem. There's a problem to be addressed. But it's saying, you know, in light of the biblical vision of men and women in partnership together and women being people of strength, how do we, how do women live that out? And we're really trying to provide some very specific guidance. Um, and so you find resources like that. Uh, what, another of the resources you find is a daily devotional called Life for Leaders. When we say leaders, we don't mean you have to be like a leader in business or government. Any and all of you in this room are leaders. It's an email. It's emailed every morning uh, early so you can get it in the morning if you want to. Uh, basically takes a passage of scripture, says some things about that, relates it into our lives, our work. Uh, again, work broadly defined, some questions for reflection, a prayer. Uh, you can do it all in five minutes. If you take longer, you can uh, you know, spend more time with the questions for reflection. I know some small groups that use this for their, their curriculum. So uh, different things you can do with that. It's free. Uh, again, if you go to dupree.org, you will find it, Life for Leaders, you can sign up and begin to receive this. And so that's something we like to do. But one of the things I've discovered is that basically people under 30 don't do email unless they have to work. They don't do that. My kids don't do email. I send my kid an email, forget it. They'll never see it. They also don't answer their phone. I don't know if any of you have children my age. They don't answer their phone either. You have to text them. If you text them and say, I'm going to call, then they'll answer the phone. <laughs> if you text them and say, I sent you an important email, they might look at it. Okay, that's just it. Uh, so in our work, we're saying, you know, how can we reach, we want to do, we want to really encourage people devotionally and, and encourage people to know scripture and to make connections, scripture to their work. How are we going to do this with people who don't read email? Well, I've got a staff and they're great and they're all young. Most of them are millennials. Like the average age of my staff, I think, is 27. So I asked my five staff people, how are we going to reach your, you? And they said, well, we, we don't do email. We do Instagram. Now, some of you in this room are saying, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Some of you are saying, I don't know what that is. Instagram is a web platform that basically you put up pictures. That's it. You can have um, a... Um, a caption with the picture you can put words under but it's basically pictures so if you go to your if you go to your Instagram I'm just hoping none of my friends have put up like questionable pictures here that I'm going to show this in front of the group but yeah so like oh you can actually put up little movies too so there's you know it's a picture and it's a picture, 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 and, a picture, and that's what they, that's what it is. Um, so my staff says, so what we got to do is we got to take the devotion, we got to kind of shrink down the text, so not as much stuff, and we put a picture on Instagram with the, uh, the abbreviated devotion as the caption. And, and that'll work for, you know, millennials. I'm like, great. So we're, we've just begun doing that, about three weeks in now. If you go to, if you're in Instagram, Dupree Center, D-E. Dupree Center, you'll find us. You can um, connect up with us and uh, follow us and begin to get those devotions if you like the shorter version. Uh, 
So those are the main, main resources we have. But I should say that in the Life for Leaders email version, I'm actually working through Ephesians very slowly. So I think right now I'm right around Ephesians 1.17, and it'll probably take me a year to get through because I'm not rushing. I'm just letting the text sit with it and sharing things that I want to share out of that that I think God has for us. So if any of the things that I have shared seem of interest to you, you can also kind of follow along through the Life for Leaders devotion at Dupree.org. And again, we don't charge you for it. We're not going to send you, you know, we don't sell your, your email to other people or send you a lot of junk or whatever. So, you're good. A question? Yes? Yeah, you need the mic or it's not a question. And Mark, there's an e-book too, right? There's a Okay, I have a mic. Work project. There's an e-book. That's right. Do we, have, do we put that link anywhere? Or that it'll be in the bulletin and it'll be emailed out to everybody. Okay. Or Instagram to them. Thank you. I'm a part of an awesome project called the Theology of Work. And one of the things we've done is a whole Bible commentary on everything the Bible says about work. But then there are also small pieces. There is a really excellent short, uh, it's maybe 20 pages short thing on calling in the Bible. Basic stuff on calling. It's an ebook that we produce. We sell the ebook for like five bucks. But for you, it's free if you use the link that's in the bulletin tomorrow. I'm serious, it's free. And once again, you know, we're not going to. I mean, you might get a few more mailings from Theology of Work, but it's, it's really good stuff. So it's not just mine. I'm just one player in that. But yeah, that would be the other resource. Thanks for mentioning that. OK, question. Yes, uh, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on something you said towards the end. You said something along the lines, uh, what we do all week is meant to be a reflection of Christ, what we do, how we spend our time, how we treat people. Could you um, just expand on that a little bit with some examples of yeah. maybe do's and don'ts sure. of yeah and, and so it used to be as we were discovering that god cares about what happens in our workplace we went to some fairly obvious things like well i i should probably be a witness to christ at work so i should share christ with my colleagues it, that's a fine thing when it's appropriate and in the right context or, you know, maybe I should, I don't know, put a cross, you know, on my wall. Or we did stuff like that. And, and I, I'm not making fun of that. I think those are good steps. The thing that we come to realize is that for Christ to be honored in my work, it's not just about doing some extra things or having a Bible study with some of my work people, you know, on Tuesday morning. That's a great thing. It's about, it ultimately becomes about how I do everything I do. And you say, well, what's that going to look like? So I'll give you some examples. Um, a, a woman I, I know is a, an executive at Apple, a senior executive at Apple. She's also 27 years old. Went to NYU. Any of you go to NYU? Any? Yeah, OK. She, she's amazing. And as she has grown in her faith and the relation of her faith to work, she has changed some of her work practices. So number one, she now realizes that some of the people in her, under her authority are people who have families. And so she tries really hard to end the meetings in time so they can get home for dinner and won't email them for like a couple hours so they can have, I, I mean, that sounds crazy, but if you know that world, that's like a huge thing, right? Because she wants to honor their family time. Another thing she has done, um, she, she had, it had been her way, and it's common in that world, in a meeting context, if somebody has, has not done well, you call them out in the meeting, and you say things that are not necessarily mean, but you, you put people on the spot. There's kind of the, and she realized, you know, as a Christian, I, I don't think I, I'm going to do that anymore. And so now if somebody hasn't measured up, she'll wait till after the meeting and go, in private with them because she wants to respect them in that relationship. I mean, those are very, you know, they're almost boring examples, but they, they are examples. Sometimes it's people who, um, well, I, I know, another woman I know, this is a more obvious but a tougher one, was told that she needed to misrepresent 
the company's finances in the report that went to the stockholders, or she would lose her job. Uh, and she believed that as a Christian she should not do that, so she quit. Now she had the, the means to quit. Sometimes people are in, that would be in a really, really difficult situation. But the point was for her, it, it, it's how you live each way. It's a lot about, I think, how we treat people. So I mentioned the whole Me Too thing and the whole sexual harassment at work. I mean, that's a problem that needs to be dealt with. But as a Christian, what I am, I mean, I'm concerned about that and I don't want that to happen or, and I've talked to my, my, uh, my staff about that. But what I'm really concerned about as a Christian is how do I build workplaces that are uh, affirming, places in which people, men and women, can flourish and, and feel supported and, you know, so again, yes, no sexual harassment, but it's not like nothing. Now I want to build a positive environment. And again, for me, that's an expression of my faith. So that as we're doing our work, people are feeling affirmed, they're growing, they're, they're, they're flourishing in their life, they're feeling supported and encouraged, uh, they're feeling safe, they're feeling respected because they are respected. So again, f for me, that's one way I, I live out my faith in my work and and I would aspire to do that in in any work context not just because I I work in, in a seminary does that help that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about and I'm sure many of you as I do this you're saying oh yeah yeah in my work yeah you know maybe you just mostly work on spreadsheets but on spreadsheets even you're making many decisions about what you're going to put in there and the way you're going to do it. And, you know, you can always maneuver things. If you're a person committed to the truth, what that, what's that going to look like? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So it really is. I, I, one other example. I know we're running past time, but this is a good example, so I'm going to use it. Um, a man named Don Flo. Any of you know Don Flo by any chance? Don Flo is a car dealer in North Carolina. He's the most uh, successful car dealer in North Carolina. He owns like, it's like 20 plus dealerships now. He's done extremely well. Don Flo is a deeply committed Christian. And early in his life, as he was beginning to you know, build his business, he discovered something that was deeply concerning to him, which was that basically the wealthier people were getting better deals on cars than the less wealthy people. And the reasons had to do with the way people are, are enculturated, that in general people are wealthy, deal with money and bartering, and they're, they're more self-confident. Um, those who were less wealthy, which in North Carolina often was racially connected, were people who were more submissive to authority, less uh, comfortable with the ways you get deals. And as a Christian, he's looking at this, and he's saying, well, that's not OK. But he's also a business person. He's got to have business and he's got to make it work. So he and his people, they worked really hard. And, and what they came up with uh, early on before this was done very much was a, a I don't know exactly what you call it, but the price is the, what the price is. They don't, there's no more bartering here. There's no more, oh, I got to go talk to my manager. The price on the car is the price you pay. So they dropped all their prices and that's the price. And they did that out of Don's commitment to justice for, for the less well-off people. Now, he's also a thriving business. He's done well. So this wasn't charity, but it was a, it was a commitment to justice in that pricing matter. Now, I think that's a big example, but that would be an example of someone who is deeply thinking about how your faith is lived out in the car business. It's kind of amazing. No. I know we're near the uh, end here. All right, we're going to push, we're going to push pause right here. A uh, couple things. Uh, if you do have questions, uh, Mark is going to be up here for the next 15 minutes, and then that's it. We've got to cut him off uh, to get ready for tomorrow. So we want to save his voice for tomorrow. Mark will be preaching uh, tomorrow morning at, at both services uh, in the morning. And so welcome. We'd love to have you come back and be part of either 8.30 or 10 o'clock uh, services. Uh, then on Sunday night, so tomorrow night at 5 o'clock, 
Uh, we recorded an interview uh, with him this afternoon, and that will be shown at the 5 o'clock service if you're part of that, that worship service. This particular session, the earlier session, uh, those are both available on YouTube. Go out to the, the church's uh, channel. You can check those out. Um, this one is going to be posted just shortly after it gets done, uh, as soon as we get done here. And so you'll be able to see that right away again if you want to share that with folks. And you'll get an email sent to you that has the links to those, those resources, the ebook. Um, as well as the Dupree Center uh, resources that are available uh, for that. Again, if you want to ask more questions, he'll be up here. Uh, again, fill out your, uh, your little survey card there, and I'll be collecting those right over there. And I see a question. Can I pray? For yes, absolutely. All right. All right. I probably was like, interrupting Jimmy's prayer, but I'm going to pray. Let's pray. Uh, gracious God, thanks for the chance that, that I've had to be with these folks tonight. I know I've thrown a lot of stuff at them, and I, I, I pray that what... I have shared that is true would stick, and if I've shared anything that's not true, it would not stick. But I also pray that whatever it is you're wanting to say to each person here, um, that, that, that you would speak through your spirit to them about where, where you are both challenging and encouraging them to live out their vocation, to walk worthy of their calling that you've given to them. And I pray also for this church. I'm so thankful for this community of the faithful in this place who have borne witness to you for well over 100 years are, are uh, still going at it. Lord, bless them. Um, help them to know how they can live as children of light in this community such that the people around her will see that, uh, that the gospel is real because of who these people are in their life together and then as they, as they go out into the community. So use them. Uh, bless them, and I, I thank you for them and the chance that we have to be together this weekend. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks, man. Thank you.